exploring the debate on whether Hawaii is a U.S. state, or a nation which successor was the Republic of Hawaii. Or is the government of Hawaii the monarchy called the Hawaiian Kingdom that existed before 1893? There are a lot of people with a lot of opinions on this topic. However we are going to base the answers in this documentary on the thesis and presentations given by David Tsai. David Tsai is the self-proclaimed chairman of the Hawaiian Kingdom according to www.hawaiiankingdom.org and is involved in several real estate title disputes and criminal legal matters regarding this information that he presented to the Permanent Court of Arbitration, The Hague, regarding the case. Larson vs. The Hawaiian Kingdom in the year 2000 This documentary is written and compiled by Ryan Thompson. Ryan Thompson is not a professional historian, or political scientist. This video will give references to the sources in the description. You are encouraged to do your own research. Even if Ryan Thompson was a professional in these matters, everyone has bias, and no one should accept received information at face value. If you are interested in forming an educated thought on these topics, always dig deeper and do your own research. Ryan runs a blog and radio show at www.disruptarian.com and more information and interviews regarding this topic can be found there. This is Think Tech Hawaii. Community matters here. Good morning, everybody. Aloha. My name is Mark Shklov. I'm the host of Think Tech Hawaii's Law Across the Sea program. Today, our program is titled Larson versus Hawaiian Kingdom. And my guest is David Keanu Sai. Keanu, as we call him, Keanu Sai has a PhD in political science and teaches at Windward Community College. Quite a few years ago, Keanu represented the Hawaiian Kingdom as its agent before the Permanent Court of Arbitration in The Hague, in the Netherlands. In a case involving claims by a citizen of Hawaii named Lance Larson. Mr. Larson claimed that the Hawaiian government had been negligent by allowing American laws to be imposed in the Hawaiian Kingdom. This is an interesting case. I went to arbitration in The Hague. We'll ask about the results. We'll discuss the case, its background, its history, its meaning, its ramifications, and current status. Recent events will bring this case to the forefront soon. First of all, aloha, good morning, Keanu, good to see you. Thanks for inviting me. Oh, my pleasure, my pleasure. Now, I, I, I need to ask you, Hawaiian Kingdom, uh, I thought we were the state of Hawaii, uh, and before that, the territory, and before that, maybe a republic or pro provisional government. Uh, so, Keanu, you're going to have to explain to me, what, is there a Hawaiian kingdom? Is there a Hawaiian government? What's the difference? Please. Okay. Well, that's, that's a good question. <laughs> <laughs> I thought the same thing as you before. <laughs> okay. Um, well, when I'm speaking about the Hawaiian kingdom, so let me give it some personal context. Okay. My great-grandparents, so my tutu's parents on both mother and father's side, were born in the 1880s. In the 1880s, this place here in Hawaii was called the Hawaiian kingdom. So I'm referring to that country called the Hawaiian kingdom. Okay. Now, in order to explain why I say the kingdom still exists today, that's not a sovereignty uh, proposition. It's not an aspiration. What I'm speaking to is the legality and the facts that the country, the Hawaiian kingdom, still exists. So in 1893, the Hawaiian kingdom was actually one of 44 independent states in what was known as the family of nations. Okay, only 44. Today, there's 193. Actually, 195 if you uh, don't include those that are members of the UN, such as Kosovo and uh, uh, Rotonga. So in, in 1893, Hawaii was its own country, its own nation, its own government. Okay. Exactly. All right. um, it had treaties with all the European powers, okay. including the United States. By 1893, it had over 90 embassies and consulates all over the world. Wow. It was a constitutional system, very progressive, and by 1864, it adopted the separation of, po separation of powers doctrine. 
Okay, so in the annotations of the video, I have mentioned the Republic of Hawaii and how David Tsai, in this interview and most of his presentations, he skips over that. Now, if you go to disruptarian.com forward slash recognition, you can go to this uh, page, these pages that I've set up showing these letters of recognition from 20 countries in 11 languages on four continents recognizing. Now, why does that matter? It's because David Tsai goes from the Hawaiian Kingdom to the U.S. annexation of Hawaii. He skips the in-between parts. He skips, usually, the 1887 Bayonet Constitution, where native-born Hawaiians, uh, whether they were indigenous or Caucasian, they were both, uh, rose up against their kingdom, their government, and insisted that uh, King uh, Kalaluka, and I always butcher these names, but the king at the time, uh, stopped spending money lavishly that the kingdom didn't have. In fact, the U.S. inherited $15 million of debt that the Hawaiian kingdom had when they annexed them. Um, that they stopped trying to override the legislature. They continued to try to make racial voting a thing, and they did, in fact, succeed in that, uh, preventing Japanese people, genetic Japanese people, whether they were born in Hawaii or not, from voting. Um, and that, that's what Queen Lily Ukulani was doing uh, when the overthrow happened, is that she was trying to uh, push through a new constitution that allowed only genetic Hawaiians to vote. And that's when the provisional government, the Committee of Safety, rose up and overthrew the government. Now, if you look at people like Sanford B. Dole and the others that, that rose up, they were born in Hawaii. Their grandparents were born in Hawaii. These people were, you know, native Hawaiian. The word native itself means a place where you were born. So these were native Hawaiians Hawaiian kingdom subjects rising up against their own government, like has happened all over the world in many other places. And he'll eventually mention Germany and Prussia. This happened there as well, where, you know, Germany annexed Prussia. So you'll see that, you know, all of these countries, he, he mentioned Switzerland and the Geneva Convention. They sent letters of recognition in, on September 11, 1894, recognizing the Republic of Hawaii as the legitimate successor of the Kingdom of Hawaii. Uh, Spain, Russia, Portugal, Peru, uh, Sweden, Norway. Here's the Netherlands. He talks about the Hague Convention by, um, let me just see here. Uh, these files are so big. You know, I got them in their original size and format and, and pixels. So it takes a long time to load. So it probably won't load right away. But I've given links where you can download these right from the State Archive. And uh, Ken Conklin is the one responsible for retrieving these from the State Archive. So, uh, let me just say, yeah, November 2nd, 1894. This is when Queen Emma of the Kingdom of the Netherlands personally signed a two-page letter dated November 2nd, 1894 to President, President Sanford B. Dole recognizing the Republic of Hawaii. So all of these letters of recognition, all of these allies of the Kingdom of Hawaii transferred their treaties from the Kingdom of Hawaii to the Republic of Hawaii. And that's why they sent these very important letters of recognition so that the uh, treaties they already had formed stood up still in this new uh, government in the, in the Republic of Hawaii. So all of these recognize the Republic of Hawaii. It's very important, and I don't know why he skips that. It's, he's very intellectually dishonest for not mentioning these things. Which was quite amazing, given, given the timeline of Hawaii's constitutional evolution, which, re, which began in 1840. Now, we're just talking 24 years later. Mm -hmm. So that country itself, uh, as it adopted the separation of powers doctrine, in 1893, Queen Lili Okalani was the executive monarch. Okay, so you had, you had an executive, you had a legislature, I, I, I assume is what you're saying, and, exactly. and a judicial. Exactly. Okay. Okay. Now, in international law, as it existed at that time as it exists now, the country itself, the Hawaiian Kingdom, was referred to as a state, an independent and sovereign state. Now, the term independence is a political term. It means the laws that exist over Hawaii is exclusively only administered over Hawaiian territory, independent of other laws that may be administered over other territories, such as the United States, Mexico, and so forth. So when anybody comes into the Hawaiian Kingdom, they are subject to Hawaiian Kingdom law. Okay. Okay. Now, let me compare that to Japan at the same time. Japan did not have independence. Its independence was not recognized, nor did China. Uh, these were non-European powers. They were states, but they weren't independent. They were the subject of unequal treaties. So like in Japan, 
if an American citizen gets into trouble in Japan, let's say in 1880, he could only be prosecuted under American law through the American consulate, called consular jurisdiction. Uh, the same applied in China as well. Siam, okay. Persia, Ottoman Turks. Did you know the Hawaiian Kingdom had an unequal treaty with Japan that if any Hawaiian subject got into trouble in Japan, let's say in 1880, he could only be prosecuted under Hawaiian Kingdom law hmm. by the Hawaiian consulate through consular jurisdiction. No, I didn't know that. So they were clearly a member of the family of nations. Okay, they, they bought into that, that regime too. Now again, he keeps skipping back and forth, but he is once again skipping this idea of the Republic of Hawaii that was recognized by all of the Hawaiian Kingdom's treaty holders and allies. So he should be mentioning this about this point, but he's not. And then when we talk about annexation, he talks about how there was no treaty. Uh, so there's no annexation because there was no treaty. Uh, there was a treaty in 1898, and I've got that on my website as well. And that treaty was passed by joint resolution, which has every bit of the effect of any other law passed by Congress. It has to be passed by uh, the House and the Senate and signed by the President, which it was. So that treaty, which was welcomed by the Republic of Hawaii, the Republic of Hawaii, Sanford B. Dole, asked for annexation. The Newlands Resolution was passed by uh, joint uh, resolution, passed on July 4th, 1898. Uh, so another celebration for us in Hawaii for Independence Day. Um, but it was passed just like, you know, any bill was passed, amendment to the Constitution was passed. It was fully legal in every way, passed by the Senate, passed by the uh, House, and then sent to the President to be signed. So it was passed by all, th all three of those, you know, bodies of government in the United States, and it was requested by Sanford B. Dole, the president of the Republic of Hawaii. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Right. Actually, it was the Hawaiian Kingdom that was the first to recognize Japan's full independence, Queen Lili Ukulani, January 18, 1893, hmm. where the Hawaiian Kingdom rescinded consular jurisdiction, thereby subjecting Hawaiian subjects to the full scope and application of Japanese law. Okay. Interesting. So that kind of gives you a, a sense of what the Hawaiian Kingdom was at that time, mm -hmm where my great-grandparents lived in. Okay. Yeah, so that, that was a system. Now, international law separates the government, which is the, the, the physical apparatus that exercises the sovereignty of the state. So the Hawaiian kingdom in international law is the state. The government is its physical apparatus that exercises that authority. Okay. Why that is so important is international law recognizes that the state would still exist if its government was militarily overthrown. All right. Yeah. Another fact of history that David Sy fails to mention in this interview, and most all of his presentations, is the Morgan Report. He will talk about James Blount, who came to Hawaii at the request of Lelayu Okolani's personal friend Grover Cleveland to restore the kingdom. Blount did interviews, but not under oath, and not notarized. He just took informal statements, which when Senator John T. Morgan was sent out to investigate, he took sworn testimonies meaning failure to tell the truth would result in perjury charges, a felony, and the same witnesses that James Blount claimed to interview gave sworn statements that the statements that James Blount recorded in his report were false and that they did not make those statements. History books will say about James H. Blount. Blount was a prominent spokesman for white supremacy and strongly opposed adding a new non-white element to the American population. Read the Ignored by Dr. Cy Morgan report at www.morganreport.org. That's important. You can't erase the state just because somebody comes in, takes over the physical bodies, the physical government. Exactly. Okay. Now, a contemporary example today would be... Uh, Iraq in 2003. Mm -hmm. The Iraqi government was overthrown through shock and awe. You know, mm -hmm. Everybody saw it on CNN. Mm -hmm. But the overthrow of the Iraqi government did not equate to the overthrow of Iraq as a state. International law still recognized Iraq's existence because Iraq is the subject of international law, whereas the government is a subject of its domestic law, whether it's constitutional, absolute, uh, uh, combination, or whatever you have, uh, might be the case. Okay, so, well... So how would you change? How, how, do, how do you get rid of the state? You have to merge, right? So within international law, there are two types of states, original states, successor states, okay? Now a successor state is one that separates itself from another state. So that would be the American Revolution. 
they were British colonies, but in 1783, King George III, through the Treaty of Paris, recognized the 13 former colonies as 13 independent states in a confederation, a loose union of independent states. So that's called secession, and that is where the United States became the successor state of Great Britain. Okay, so, so why do you say the Hawaiian Kingdom still exists today? Why do you say it's still a state? What was, what was done in 1893 was the overthrow of the Hawaiian government, illegal, as concluded by President uh, Grover Cleveland. You mean when those, in his when those Marines came off the boat? January 16th, Marines landed, assisted in the overthrow of the Hawaiian government, which President Cleveland investigated through James Blount, who was the special commissioner to investigate, and concluded that his words specifically, by an act of war, the government of a friendly and confiding people has been overthrown. Now, from an international law standpoint, once a head of state makes the statement by an act of war, he just triggered state of war, okay? So in international relations, you have both state of war, state of peace. The purpose, the, the, the goal is to stay in a state of peace, but you could go into a state of war through an act of war, and that's when humanitarian law is activated. In order to transform that situation back to a state of peace, you need a treaty of uh, peace. And we have no treaty. We have no treaty of peace. And the state has not become a successor state. Right. And so you're saying there has been no change to the state. Right. I see. Okay. So, all right. I, I understand that proposition. Now, how about Larson? What, what is Larson versus the Kingdom of Hawaii? What is that about? So, given this background, okay, this context of the state still existing, no government, state of war, right? Um, humanitarian law allows for a principle to be used called the principle of necessity. Now, the, the principle of necessity is really the mother of all inventions. And a lot of things during the military is based on necessity, but also during occupations, as well as what is called um, governments in exile. So when a state has, has its government illegally, or not illegally, but its government overthrown, irrespective of whether illegal or legal, you could create a government in exile to represent the state. And that's what happened with Belgium. And when King Leopold was captured by the Germans, uh, Belgians fled to London, formed a government mm -hmm. in exile. That's right. But what they do is they represent the state because their mandate did not come from the people. There's no elections during mm. occupations. Mm. That's called necessity, the doctrine of necessity. I see. When I was in the army, a private can become a lieutenant in time of war. Mm. He assumes the chain of command. It's not his choice. It's actually his duty in order to maintain the command structure. But he's just an acting lieutenant until a properly commissioned officer comes and he gets relieved, goes back down being a private. Okay. That same principle applies at the international level. All right. So in 1995, I had come to this realization that Hawaii is not a part of the United States. Its government was illegally overthrown, so, never reinstated. So the government was taken over, the mechanical aspects of the government are taken over. But nothing changed with regards to the state, so you're, that's, the, that's the difference. And that's the cornerstone of everything. It, 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 so the key is, where did the state go, not mm. where is the government? Okay. You know, so if that state still exists, which I found that it did, in 1995, we took steps to reinstate the government as it stood in 1893, similar to a government in exile, but we did it instead a government in situ, which is within the territory. Okay. Okay. So that's what we did. All right. Yeah. Now. And when you say we, who are we talking about? There are certain individuals that were part of this. Um, I I purposely not share exactly who they are because it. It, it can get a bit contentious. Uh, you might say, from my experience, people don't take this information quite well, but I can, I can take the attacks. You're, you're involved. <laughs> you might say, I run point. <laughs> just like a military, I run point. Okay. <laughs> but I can assure you there's more people involved in that just okay. me. <laughs> All right, so, so Larson, Larson uh, has a claim based upon the fact that the state still exists the government apparatus does not of the kingdom. What, okay. are, is that right, or explain? Okay, so let me back up as yeah. to how did Larson come to make this claim. Okay. Because Lance Larson is just a regular person who's an electrician who lives on the island of Hawaii. He's not an academic, he's not a lawyer. Uh, he's, just, he's just a person who is, he's, he's a good man. But how did he get to that point? So the 
the government that was formed, which is called the Provisional Government of the Hawaiian Kingdom, the acting government by necessity, it operates on, on three, three uh, aspects of its mandate. Because it's not representing the people, but rather representing the state through its legal system by necessity, its first purpose is to expose the occupation. Second purpose is to ensure compliance to humanitarian law, which is the law of occupation. And then third, to finally provide for an effective transition to a permanent government when the occupation ends. And that's pretty much what governments in exile do. <laughs> it's just we're here in the country. I was on the Big Island back, I would say, 1997, and I gave a presentation about Hawaii being occupied and that people need to follow the laws. In particular, Section 6 of the Hawaiian Civil Code, as it stood in 1893, specifically states that the laws are obligatory upon all persons, whether subjects of this kingdom or citizens or subjects of any foreign state while within the limits of this kingdom. Lance Larson heard this, understood the presentation, and he decided to test it. He decided to test it. So you're saying e even though the state doesn't exist, the laws of the state remain in force? No, the state exists and the laws I'm, exist, I'm but yeah. the government may have been overthrown and we're just the acting government okay. exposing All right. it. All right, got <laughs> yeah. it. Yeah. So the, 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 legal, the, the legal system is basically what is independent within this state called the Hawaiian Kingdom. So it's Hawaiian Kingdom law. It's the civil code, okay. the, cri the criminal code, the constitutional law, common law. Those are the laws that I'm speaking to, which is the legal order of the Hawaiian state. Okay, so, so the state exists, right. state remains, its laws remain in effect, right. okay? The government apparatus is gone. Right. Okay, I'm, I'm beginning to get there, right. beginning to understand. But we're going to have to take a break right now, and then when we come back, you're going to have to go into the, the Larson claim. Okay? No problem. All right, so we'll be back in a minute. All right. Good. <laughs> Welcome back. My name is Mark Shklov, and I am the host of Think Tech Hawaii's Law Across the Sea. And today we are here with uh, Keanu Sai talking about Larson versus the Hawaiian Kingdom. And we've, we've got to the point where Mr. Larson heard... Keanu talking about the fact that the state, the Hawaiian Kingdom state, still exists. Its laws still exist, even though the apparatus, the, the government may have been taken over, not exist. And he heard Keanu talk, and Keanu, what happened then? What happened then? So, so when Lance Larson was in the audience, there, there are other people there. I not only explained why you need to follow Hawaiian Kingdom law, not just because it's the uh, law of the Hawaiian Kingdom, Section 6 of the Hawaiian Civil Code, um, but also as to the reason why we're in this place today. Okay, So in 1893, when the government was illegally overthrown by the United States military, they naturally carried, as a consequence of that act, a responsibility. And their responsibility, which was customary international law at that time, which was later codified in the Hague Convention, was the occupier, the one who overthrew the government, was mandated to administer the laws of the occupied state. No different than in Iraq. So in Iraq, when the government was overthrown, they established the Coalition Provision Authority to administer Iraqi law during the Iraqi occupation. They were not administering American law. Oh, okay. So this was the presentation, not okay. just Hawaiian Kingdom law. Okay, so we gotta follow the law. Gotta and, follow the law. And the state of the kingdom still exists? Gotta follow that law. And okay. I knew the problem of following the law, but my job being a member of the acting government was to expose and to present that law. Okay, so yeah. what, what was Mr. Larson? So Mr. Larson upon his own self, took it upon himself to look into the law. He found out that there was no law that regulates driver's licenses. Okay. Because 1893, there were no there were, automobiles. There was no law of the kingdom. No law of the kingdom. Okay. There are American laws, but American laws remain in America. Okay. 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 So he decided to test this okay. out, and he went to his truck. He lives in on the east side of Hawaii Island, and he took off his license plate, his okay. license plate, took off his registration, safety stickers, and so forth, and he put a big placard on the back of his truck that restated Section 6 of the Hawaiian Civil Code. Okay. The laws are obligatory. <laughs> and then he started to drive around Hilo. And okay. he got a lot of tickets. Oh, yeah. Okay. I, I guess that would happen, yeah. Okay. He went, to, he went to court, 
Okay. Uh, he was represented by Ninia Parks, an attorney. Okay. okay. And his argument was he cannot follow American law, Hawaii Vice statutes dealing with driver's license, because this is the Hawaiian Kingdom. And, and the Hawaiian Kingdom laws still control. Exactly. I see. And that if he does follow American law, he would be committing treason against the Hawaiian Kingdom. Mm. That was his argument. So Judge Sanja Shuti was a judge, presiding mm. judge. So I was actually called in by his attorney to serve as an expert witness. So I was qualified as an expert witness uh, through Judge Shuti. And I explained there's no treaty. Mm -hmm. And that a joint resolution of annexation, which the US Congress enacted in 1898, supposedly annexing Hawaii, really didn't annex anything. Because the United States could no more pass a law annexing Hawaii than it could pass a law today annexing Canada, right? There's still no treaty. So that's when uh, 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 Judge Sandra Schutte made a decision, fined him $900. And, he, and I was there, I watched this whole thing. And he, she asked him, are you going to pay this? And he said, no. If I pay it, I'm committing treason against my country. So she ordered him to be locked up for 30 days, seven days solitary confinement. Mm. Now, from an international law standpoint, what you got right there is an unfair trial, which is a war crime under Article 147 of the Geneva Convention. And you also have unlawful confinement, another war crime. And then when he was forced to pay his fine in order for him to be, uh, to be released, now that's pillaging. So his attorney was very concerned for her client who was being put in prison. I think she was concerned for his safety. Mm. And this was kind of outrageous to her, 30 days, seven days solitary confinement. Mm. That's kind of going overboard. So she didn't know what was gonna happen behind the scenes. So she was very concerned. She turned to me and she says, the provisional government, the acting government is liable because you're supposed to be protecting my client from the unlawful imposition of American laws that put her client into this predicament. Okay. And an arbitration agreement was eventually uh, agreed upon. And the Permanent Court of Arbitration received it in November of 1999 from Lance Larson's counsel, who's the moving party against the Hawaiian Kingdom, being the defendant or the respondent. And you went there and, and th yep. there was an arbitration. Yep. And, and what, what, what happened on the arbitration? Well, the first thing the Permanent Court of Arbitration had to do was to verify whether or not the Hawaiian Kingdom exists as a state in order mm -hmm. to fulfill mm -hmm. its institutional jurisdiction to form the tribunal. They did. They verified it. So hearings were held in December of 2000. We eventually won the case, the Hawaiian Kingdom, because Lance Larson was not able to come after the acting government on negligence without the United States being a party called an indispensable third party. And, and why did they have to have the United States? I mean, I, I, I can understand that logically, but what, what, what's the principle? Or so there are two there are two precedent cases in international cases, international court court cases, Monetary Gold and East Timor. These dealt with um, an indispensable third state is necessary for a moving state to proceed against defendants. Mm -hmm. Okay, so they have some. Their play is somewhere in the substance of the decision. The rule is a tribunal cannot review the conduct of a state unless that state is present in the proceedings. In order to defend itself or to exactly. make some sort of a presentation. Because there's no subpoena powers at the international okay. level. And, and at this uh, arbitration in The Hague, the uh, 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 question involved the United States and was the United States invited to be a participant? And yes. what, what happened? Yes, actually before the tribunal was formed, I was contacted by the Secretary General of the Permanent Court of Arbitration, uh, Secretary General Van Den Hout, he's a Dutch national. And when he spoke to me on the phone, now he's speaking to me as the defendant, I'm representing the defense in mm -hmm. this case. Mm -hmm. We're not the moving party, but we're the government. And he, he told me his specific words, he said that the registry cannot find any evidence that the Hawaiian Kingdom does not exist. <laughs> you notice he didn't say that the Hawaiian Kingdom is still recognized, because yeah. you're looking at the, the subject. Yeah. And that he also acknowledged that the Hawaiian Dutch Treaty was not canceled, because <laughs> we're in the Netherlands. Yeah. So then he says, and I see his specific <laughs> words, he said, in order to maintain the integrity of this case, he highly recommended that the Hawaiian government, with Lance Larson's attorney, provide a formal invitation to the United States to join in the arbitration. Okay. So on March 3rd, I traveled to Washington, D.C. March 3rd, what year? 2000. Okay. Met with, uh, we had a meeting with John Crook from the U.S. State Department, um, with Ninia Parks, the attorney for Lance Larson, and he was given uh, an official invitation to join in the arbitration. You might say I'm calling the bluff. If you can prove that the Hawaiian Kingdom 
doesn't exist, step into an international tribunal, we'll, re, we'll renegotiate an arbitration agreement for you to prove that. <laughs> uh, he began to quickly watch his P's and Q's, because I told him that our conversation would be reduced to writing and, and, and sent to the court for the record. That very next week, I get a call from the Deputy Secretary General, Phyllis Hamilton, who's an American. She tells me that the American Embassy in The Hague notified the court that they're not accepting the invitation to join in the arbitration, but they asked permission from the Hawaiian government and Lance Larson to have access to all records, mm. pleadings, and transcripts. Well, that's pretty interesting. That's called explicit recognition of the Hawaiian government, mm. its existence. But it's also not denying the existence of the Hawaiian kingdom as a state. If Hawaii was the 50th state, they would have proved it, but it's an American law that took Hawaii to begin with, which didn't affect Hawaii under international law. So they law. didn't choose to challenge the fact that no. the state of Hawaii still exists, or I'm sorry, the, that the state of the kingdom still exists. Exactly, because there's no evidence yeah. that it was extinguished. Okay. So that's when, uh, that very next month in April, was when the tribunal was formed. Mm -hmm. And that eventually led to the hearings in December after pleadings were uh, submitted uh, before the oral hearings. Okay. In, in the few minutes we have left, I'd like you to tell me what happened at that arbitration and what's happening now. So the, so, so the, the, the tribunal stated that because of the indispensable third party rule, mm -hmm. they cannot rule on whether or not Lance Larson's rights were violated during his trial right. and incarceration if the United States is not participating. So the Hawaiian Kingdom won the case. Okay, we prevailed. Okay. Now, the tribunal also left open in the award, arbitral award, fact finding. An international commission of inquiry could get around the indispensable third party rule because the, the international commission of inquiry under the permanent court of arbitration serves similar to a grand jury where they look into the facts and they assign responsibility to those facts, criminal, possible criminal or civil. Uh, it's like a combination of uh, Special Counsel Mueller with the grand jury together. Mm. That's what an international commission of inquiry okay. is. Okay. That international commission of inquiry uh, we entered into an agreement with Lance Larson on January 19, 2017. Uh, two of the commissioners have already been selected these past two days, waiting for the third commissioner, which could be a judge for the International Criminal Court. And the first sitting will be here in Hawaii for the Commission of Inquiry on January 16th and 17th, marking the 125th year of the invasion an illegal overthrow of the Hawaiian government and its occupation. When the Marines came on, yeah. came on shore. Okay, so so what are they going to be charged with finding? What what is what are they going to determine? What is this commission, this fact-finding commission, going to do? Three things. First, what is the role and function of the Hawaiian government within the framework of international humanitarian law, the laws of war and occupation? Second, what is the duty and obligation of the Hawaiian government toward Lance Larson, and by extension to all Hawaiian subjects within Hawaii, and resident abroad. And third, what is the duty and obligation of the Hawaiian government toward protected persons, resident within Hawaii, and those that are transient? So protected persons is, in humanitarian laws, uh, lab uh, identification of non-Hawaiian subjects and non-American citizens. So let's say a French national here. That person under humanitarian law is called a protected person. And the laws of occupation also protect that individual. So those are the three uh, areas that the commission will be reporting. But they will have to look at who's responsible for the unlawful imposition of American law here. Mm. And then look at what is our role. Because within an occupied state, you have a duality of legal systems, the occupied and the occupier. We're in this position because the occupier did not conform and comply with international humanitarian law. Okay, so... The United States is still not a party to this. Yep, because it's like a grand jury. Okay. These, they're just looking at the facts, assign responsibility, but it'll, it'll be up to, if they issue what could be called indictments, it will be up to other governments throughout the world to prosecute for war crimes under what is called universal jurisdiction or the International Criminal Court or whoever the commission feels or recommends that can handle this type of situation. Our goal here is not to exacerbate the problem. Our goal here is to address the problem, have a procedure that is set and recognized, and move toward compliance. We need to ensure that international law is complied with. That's the goal. We are now dealing with the fact that it hasn't been complied with for over 125 years. Mm. Well, coming up to 125 years. So it's a, it, it, it's a hard pill to swallow, but I can assure you it's real. And people just need to be educated on this. And 
we're here to fix the problem. And we're coming up in January to a hearing or a fact-finding commission. Yep. And so we're going to hear more about this in the future. Absolutely. Keanu, I want to thank you very much for being here today and telling us about this very interesting case and what is going to happen in the future. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Mahalo. Well, that video was from September of 2017, I believe. It is now uh, August 9th of 2019. There was no fact-finding commission. And he says that only states can enter into this International Court of Arbitration. That is untrue. Businesses, corporations, this is a Chamber of Commerce, the International Chamber of Commerce. This isn't a, you know, state-only commission, This or state-only court. This is for anybody. He's full of it.